Hello, I'm your host today, Corey Hampson from Habitat Galleries, taking over for, from my brother, uh, Aaron Shea, who usually runs these wonderful Zooms. Um, let's get started, somehow. <laughs> so here Aaron is in front of the Imagine Museum, which celebrated their fifth anniversary. Um, we're going to talk and dive a little bit into that this uh, this Zoom. It's going to be a kind of a, a exciting um, explanation to what happened to my life about five years ago. We uh, some uh, housekeeping. We've got an exhibition of Leah Winkfield and Stephen Clements called Codependence. You can see that at www.sharing breath.com. There are seven sculptures, which really, um, uh, can, they're really spectacular because you, you have this wonderful feeling of, of man and the support that they have, which is dog. I have two dogs myself, Wicket and Boomers. They're 13 years old. And so every time I see something like this, it's like it, it, it has a special part in my heart. And I hope I hope you uh, get a chance to visit the website and take a look at some of the available pieces and just to see if, if you understand that connection that uh, that a lot of us have in our lives that's kind of like an unspoken thing. So it's really quite a beautiful uh, body of work. We have three exhibitions that are in the gallery right now. One of them by Mark Laputa, who is currently living in Arizona. His wife's in Canada. They're kind of going back and forth trying to see each other, but the work is absolutely incredible. I realized that all three bodies of work that we have at the gallery have been heavily influenced by nature, have been influenced by wind and water, um, about the sea life underneath the sea. It's just, you know, uh, and they're all done differently. Cast work, we've got blown work by Laputa that's blown and polished very nicely. And then of course, Wilfred Gruten, who has done some incredible um, laminating and painting on glass, which is, you know, I don't think there's another artist in the world working like him. There used to be Carol Cohen back in the day, but he's taken that step a little, one step further and started to uh, uh, laminate them. And he's become, they've be They've got laminates like a special word for glue, by the way. Uh, but he uses this glue called Hextel, and he's able to glue these pieces together to create sculpture. Really spectacular. And then April 22nd, Peter Hora, Habitat. Uh, we've got a Zoom, a solo exhibition with uh, not Lukash, who we usually work with, but his brother, David. Unfortunately, Lukash is a very hard man to get a hold of. He's living in the Maldives. What a rough life. And uh, David's going to be there to... Uh, to help us along with Peter giving a talk about uh, geometry and glass. So we're, we're kind of excited to see what that's gonna be like. Again, April 22nd, clear your calendar. NGG, not grandma's glass. Where did this title come from? Well, it, it's an interesting story. I was talking to Aaron once and we were talking about, you know, I, I, my, my grandmother, she collected this China like white china with the blue on it. And, and, and she passed it down to my mother. And my mother said, oh my God, I'm gonna pass this down to my son. And so what do I do with this, this, this beautiful china that she had on display my entire childhood? I put it in a Tupperware container and I take that cup, Tupperware container and, and I set it down and I use it as a stepping stool to get my kids toys from up above there. So the, the, the idea is, hey, you know, this is new stuff. This might not be what exactly is collectible, but it's kind of breaking the barriers of not traditional glass, but something that might be happening that's new, interesting, exciting. So uh, my props to Aaron at hashtag NGG, who has created this wonderful 12 month exhibition of different artists. And a lot of them have gone on to other things like uh, Ata had a show just recently at Heller. And, um, you know, of course, John Moran, who ended up becoming the Netflix uh, blown away winner for season three. I mean, holy smokes. Do you know how many people watch that? Millions of people watch blown away. And he was the winner, season three. They're at all at NGG. So my props to my brother, Aaron. Okay, glass 51, we're into it. June 9th, you gotta sign up for these events because we got glass blowing, we got demonstrations, we've got uh, artists flying in for all over, all over the world. We've got the gas conference. We're hosting the gas conference here in Habitat. This is gonna be the biggest, largest, most exciting international that we've ever had. Glass 51, you want a, a little preview? Please go to our tiny URL, www.tinyurl.com backslash 
just joking, forward slash blast 51. Check it out. Here's another uh, invitation. You're invited. I want you to come. Tell your family. Tell your friends. It's all free, and it's a weekend. And actually, it's a longer than a, than a weekend. It's a, it's an entire week because we got glass blowing going on in different places throughout Detroit. We got the Michigan Glass Plot Project. We've got gas conference. We've got you know, there's going to be like I said, thousands of artists flying in specifically for these events. So it's worth checking out and getting to know. And and if you want to sign up for gas, you can do that as well. Um, cause there's going to be some interesting lectures. I know we have one, Sibel Peretti's coming in as well as a number of other artists that was going to be giving a talk on Habitat's behalf. So again, another advertisement, www.tinyurl.com. Check it out. See what's happening for our masterworks auction. We're excited this year. Look at that. RV Littleton. Isn't that one of the greatest ones you've ever seen? It is spectacular. It's not quite a crown. But uh, if you can't afford a crown, it, it's like a half a crown. It's like a tiara. I don't know. It's it's really beautiful. So take a look. And of course, Harvey said one thing that I that I remember. He said, if you want to sell something, make it in blue. And look at this piece. Gorgeous. Again, in our auction um, at that weekend, June 9th. Okay, so let's talk about it. We'll get right into it. What the hell am I doing here? I wanted to tell you a little bit about my story and what what this this amazing experience that I had in in with with the Imagine Museum. It kind of just popped out of uh, nowhere. So so you know like I, I guess the the story is you know you know the, it's the it's about the recipe and it's how to create a museum from scratch because there was virtually nothing there. So what you need is you need the ingredients. You need, you know, you need your your eggs, you need your, you know, you're the right amount of financing, you need, you need your your, you know, the baking powder, or you need you need the the amount of uh, the strength and the working, and then and then you need, you know, the perfect amount of just craziness, I guess. Because it's not easy, you know, it's not easy. You need you need somebody eccentric enough to really want to create something out of nothing. You know, you need an Elon Musk. You need, you need, you need someone that sees the world much larger than it actually is. And I found that person, and it wasn't by accident. I found that person through some really good friends of mine, Marlena Rose, and of course Tom and Thomas Coates, and their beautiful kids, Coca, Lucia. They're much larger now. I don't know how old this picture is, but you know, Marlena one day called me up and she said, "Corey, I've got this woman." who is my biggest collector, my biggest client, who's interested in opening up some museum off Central in this place called St. Pete. I said, well, Moscow? She goes, no, 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 St. Pete, Florida. She said, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta talk to her. She, she wants to open up this Japanese museum, but she loves glass. She's collected my work and I'd really like to push her in that direction. So I said, what, what okay. I'll, I'll do it. I'll do it. Give me your number. So she gave me her number. I got on the phone and I, and I, and I said, I don't know who the, I didn't Google it. I don't know who I'm talking to. I'm talking to this Trish woman. And she says, she picks up the phone and she is unbelievably kind. She says, well, what, you know, who are you? I said, well, I, you know, my name's uh, Corey and, and I, you know, I work at this glass gallery and, and, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I really love what I do and I really want to show you what I do, you know? And so she said, well, you know, I, that's all good and great, but can, you know, I can't understand what you're saying. Why don't you come fly out and meet me? And so I said, sure, I, I can do that. And she goes, I want you to do it, you know, I don't know, next week. I said, well, okay, I'll do that. So, you know, I meet this woman. I know nothing about her, absolutely nothing about her, but I decide, you know, that um, I'm going to fly out and get to know her. And who is she? She's this remarkable human being. She's kind. She's giving. She loves people. She collects more people than she does art. And that's that's kind of difficult to understand. But she's also highly motivated. She loves to go out there and just find the best of the best and then make them work not a hundred percent, but Jane will tell you about 110%, you know, and she wants, she expects the, the very best and to get the very best and, you know, to be, you know, motivated, she gets up at five in the morning. She does her push-ups. She goes in the pool every single day. She reads, she's 
you know, th then after a period of time, she decides to, to take on, you know, other projects. And the woman has a tremendous amount of projects, but again, highly motivated, highly active. And, uh, you know, I kind of look up to her in, in that particular way, but also we share something. We're both passionate. I'm passionate about glass. She started to become passionate about glass, but she's just a passionate human being. She likes to dive into things. And, uh, you know, when I met her, she really just, kind of dove into our relationship and dove into our friendship and wanted to learn and, and to experience, you know, what I was passionate about, which was kind of fascinating. So what did I do? I, I got on the plane, I flew in and, and I go to dinner. Okay. They put me at, at her house. She's on the beach here in Clearwater. It's a beautiful beach. And I get to this house and, you know, it's like, the, I don't know who's at this table. You know, you got you got this lighting guy that doesn't speak any English. You got, I, I think he's an architect, but I swear he's like a hippie from the 70s. You got another guy who's just standing there that doesn't talk. He's like a mute. I got this woman that 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 uh, came from another museum. I got, you know, I don't know who's who. You know, I got I, the, the person that sold their, the properties there. I mean, I don't know who these people are, but here I am, you know. And so I'm expecting some lavish dinner because we were in this mansion on the beach. And what do I get? I get this this TV. I'm, I'm telling you, I get a TV dinner. You know, the, the one with the hard brownie, you know, that you, you, you break your tooth on. I don't, that's what I get. I get this TV dinner. And, and, and so after dinner, I, I don't even know what to say. I'm like, well, this really nice Salisbury steak. I don't know. I don't know. But I get this. I mean, everything doesn't really make sense. You know, I mean, because because she's got this like huge, beautiful home. And, you know, she's got these strange people all around me. And I have to give this pitch, this 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 pitch about the museum. Luckily, Marlene is at the table and I look over at her and she's just as you know horrified as I am. We don't know what the hell's going on, but I am going to give Trish Glass 101. So like I said, there's these strange people walking in and out. You know, one time I was at her house and there was like somebody, you know, I was living there for like a week because our house was under construction and I had somebody just walked up from downstairs, like the person living in the closet or something. I said, what is your name? He opens up the refrigerator. I'm like, who, you're opening up the refrigerator? Yeah, I don't, you know, so I don't know these, but what I realized is she's so kind and so generous that she just allows her house to be this like hippie commune. So people are constantly coming in and out. You don't know who the hell these people are, but I swear this is like one of the guys. Like I don't, I, I don't, I don't know where he came from, but you know, fascinating. So here I am, glass one hundred and one. I'm giving my talk, and I'm brilliant. Okay, I'm giving the greatest talk I've ever given in my life. I'm sitting there. I'm talking about Dominic Colbino. I'm talking about Harvey Littleton in the '62 and the four seventy five marble. I'm talking about Toledo. I'm talking about Wisconsin. I'm talking about Chihuly, the god of glass comes over, you know, and starts the program at RISD, the Pilchuck, the influence, and I'm so excited. I'm even more excited than I am now. Everyone, I look up and she's sleeping. It's okay. I gave it my all. I look over and she is like snoring. I don't know, it's drool, I know, no drool, but I, she's, I, you know, poured the hell out of her. So, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just finished, I, I just finished my talk. Like I didn't, I didn't know what else to do, but I finished my talk to these strange people in the room. And uh, then I got done and she woke up and she goes, what is, what is that? What, what, what am I looking at? You know, what, what, it was my screensaver. It was my screensaver. For the last five years, I was working on this family, glass family tree. And I was putting all these names, like uh, for example, at Lino, or uh, Lino 1979, but uh, you know, let's say Chihuly, ended up teaching, you know, an artist through a professor, you know, he's a professor, he ends up teaching at RISD, Tudzinski, Tudzinski ends up teaching another artist. So it was a past, a lineage, you know, a genealogy of, of art glass. And I'm actually quite proud of it, you know, and it didn't take a tremendous amount of research. I have 3,200 names. These are the names that I represent, that I focused on, because I was trying to hone in on what I could do, but the whole family tree is much larger and grander than this. And a lot of, you know, I had some issues. Some artists are like, I don't want my name associated with that professor. He was a, he was an asshole. I don't want my name. So I had to like, you know, switch some things around, but for the most part, it makes sense. You know, you're going from a seed to a tree, to the bark, 
For example, pilchuck would be one of these branches and all pilchuck is another leaf or another twig. And that is a different professor from pilchuck. And then the leaf would be the artist. So it, it takes on this wonderful lineage. And she says, oh my God, I absolutely love it. I want you to build this for me. And I said, I said what? Uh, uh, okay. <laughs> so um, I flew back. I said, wow, what a successful uh, talk I gave. I, I said, I, I went to my staff. I brought them in a meeting. I said, we got to, I don't know what she wants me to build, but we got to build something. So we, you know, the, the, this is a museum. I think we could turn it into like a, a glass, a legacy for, for art glass in the world i mean we've got corning we've got chrysler we've got all these other museums but i think we could we could do it for for studio glass from 1962 on and make it just you know about artists that that use the 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 material as i mean for for their expression so i i went back to the staff and i got them in this meeting and and we all kind of figured out that we're going to focus on about 50 artists all american because this is the american story of how glass developed in the United States as an art form. So, you know, we we focused on my family tree and here's the tree with the blossoms. I love this tree, isn't that gorgeous? And I got the pink coming in, I love that. So, you know, you got Harvey Littleton who taught his course in 1962, 1964. That's when about the time Dale Chihuly said, oh, I'm gonna take this, that's beautiful. I wanna take this course. I wanna pass on that lineage. So I'm gonna do that at RISD, but also I'm gonna start a program at Pilchuck in, in 1971. And then uh, his main gaffer who you know drove trucks at Pilchuck in 1978, 79 was of course, Billy Morris. And then Billy Morris went on to have this marvelous career and he ended up, wasn't so much a professor, but ended up hiring Shelly Allen to work on the work. And you can see just a wonderful lineage of glass all the way from the sixties, all the way till now. And, you know, it keeps on going. Cause you know, her, um, if you look at uh, William Morris's work, there are these beautiful vessels. And at one time in the nineties, you know, he was, he was just decorating the surface of these vessels with blown glass. And one time in the nineties, these beautiful surfaces popped off and became three dimensional. And so, there's Billy Morris's work. Then you got Shelley Allen. Then Shelley Allen, of course, help, you know, you have Raven Sky River, who is Shelley Allen's gaffer. So gaffer after gaffer after gaffer. And I think Raven Sky River is one of the most talented artists working with glass today. But um, needless to say, that was our idea. And we had to pitch the story. So um, we did. You know, I, I went out there and I said, you know, I really want you to I've got the whole collection developed. I took the gallery and I turned each room to look like what I thought was a museum. So I took this lineage and I brought it in. And, and to do that, I had to go search down some older pieces. And it was, it was very difficult uh, to search them down. Um, but what I wanted was not just a, an era, a, a body of work. In, in other words, I didn't want just oh, here's a collection from 2000. I wanted people to actually see the work from the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. I want them to see the lineage and what these artists have done and how they've moved and to compare the work and juxtaposed next to each other to see the differences of how they've grown in their career. And so I searched down all these works from the 60s and 70s. We call them the uglies because they are pretty hideous, but they they do tell the story. They're the early pieces of, of a lot of these artists who have successfully worked with the material. So, you know, I pitched the idea and uh, Trish is like, that's, that's good and great, you know? And um, let's go back to the, some glass. I pitched the idea. She says, that's good and great. I like, I like this, I like this, okay. Um, why don't I come fly out and see what you've done? So that's the next step. So she gets on a plane, she flies out. She's here for one hour. She's walking around the gallery. I've got like 450 pieces on display. They're all on different pedestals. And, and I just want her to just kind of get an idea and look at a piece and maybe she's interested in that one or maybe she just to get an idea of what the museum could look like. But I've spent a tremendous amount of energy and time and finances putting this together. So much to the point where we nearly went bankrupt. 
I had to fly a lot of work in. I had very little time to do so. I paid for a lot of the shipping. It was just, it, it was, it was crushing. But I had this feeling that that this woman shared the same passion that I shared. So she came in, she was here for one hour, she walks around. She doesn't say a damn thing. I mean, nothing. She says nothing. I said, I don't even know. You know, she's like as calm as a Buddhist cow. I mean, there's no even like expression on her face. She gets her plane and she takes off. And 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 right then I I I came back up. I was so exhausted from from putting the show together. I went upstairs and I and I cried. I, I locked myself in 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 my office and I cried because I put so much energy into this and I took my father's legacy who started this gallery and 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 I and I gambled it away. You know, I felt like I gambled it away. And that's, you know, I'm not a gambling type of guy. I'm not the guy that goes to the casino and is like, hey, uh, well, let's put it on red. Like I'm not that guy. You know, I'm I'm it, it was it was tough. And there's a lot of pressure because in life. Ultimately, what you want to do is make your dad happy. I mean, you want to make your parents happy. You want to make them proud. And I felt like I just took that and, you know, threw it away. Not only that, I was I was thinking about the staff, you know, and how hard they worked. And so, I don't know. I just broke down and cried. It happens. <laughs> um, so, a week goes by, and I don't hear from her, of course, you know. And so, I said, uh, Debbie. Debbie's our bookkeeper and our office manager. She's been with us for years. I said, Debbie, why don't you give um, Trish a call? So she calls up Trish and she says, you know, um, I got Corey on the phone for you. Will you talk to him? And so I get on the phone. She's like, who is this? I said, you know, it's, I'm Corey. I'm Corey. I have that gallery. You, you can, I don't know who, who I'm like, I'm the glass, the glass guy. I'm the, I'm the glass guy. You know, the guy with the glass. She said, she said, you know, oh, I, yeah, I remember you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember. I was, yeah, I went and saw, I said, well, you, are you interested in any of this stuff? And she goes, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so we're talking. She said, I said, well, oh, oh, you know what? You really looked at that rich royal. There was a beautiful blue rich royal. And she goes, you know what? I love that. I'll, t I'll take it. I'll take it. And I said, oh, okay. So I transfer her over back to Debbie. Debbie gets on the phone and Debbie says, are you interested in the rich royal? She goes, yeah, how much is that? And uh, Debbie said, well, that's going to be a, a, about $26,000. And she said, I don't understand. $26,000 for 450 pieces? And right then, she acquired the largest body of work that has ever been acquired by any single human being of art glass in the world. She said... She wants all of them. Now, of course, I didn't sell them for $26,000, but she wanted all of them. And I thought she was just going to buy like a rich royal. I mean, that would have got me out of the shipping ordeal that I was in. So, I mean, I was like, oh my God, this is real. This is really happening. So the next thing you know, my whole life becomes Imagine, okay? I literally fly out there and I see the Imagine Museum for the first time. It's a schoolhouse in the middle of St. Petersburg, Florida. It is a tiny little building that she wants to turn into this. And I'm, I don't know, you know, and, and I'm telling you the budget is like duct tape. I don't I, you know, there is no, but I don't know what the budget is. There's very little budget, but she wants to turn, you know, this into that, you know, it's, so I, I don't know, but she's, she's, <laughs> So this is this becomes my life. It becomes my life. I'm working on pedestals. I'm working on paint. I'm trying to figure it out. I become this museum ater, museum ater, museum person. I don't know. I become this museum guy, I guess. And so you know, my life is like, oh my god, what the hell am I doing? You know, I'm an art dealer. I'm not a museum guy. You know, um, so you start hiring staff. You know, and the staff, of course, are a lot of her friends, and they don't really know what's going on because they're her friends. You know, they don't, they're like, oh, what did you do? Oh, you like a museum? You're hired. Oh, what did you do? You, 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 oh, you said museum? You're hired. You know, <laughs> it was like, it was like, uh, you know, oh, you don't have a job. Yeah, you would be really good as a, as a museum curator experience person. You know, I, I, you know, it was, it was really kind of re remarkable. The first group of people came in and I don't know, you know, it was, it was kind of funny. They had this guy, Bo, which is the nephew who I really love, you know, but I mean, they gave him like 15 jobs. The guy was the contractor. He was the, you know, the, the developing pedestals, running this, you know, machine, doing a production company. I mean, he was all over the place. 
So again, you know, it was a schoolhouse. So I said, well, why St. Pete? You know, what does St. Pete have to offer? So I started to explore St. Pete a, lit, a little bit and I discovered all these incredible museums. I mean, you've got the Museum of Fine Art of St. Petersburg on the left-hand corner here. You've got the History Museum, but look at the architecture, the arts and crafts over there on the right. That's a $50 million building. I mean, arts and crafts could be some of the most boring stuff I've ever seen in my life, but look at this building. It's unbelievable. And then down below, of course, you got you know, um, the miniature Louvre, which is the dolly, the same guy that did the glass from the Louvre came out and actually created the glass for the dolly. And of course you've got the Raymond James collection, bronze Indians, but that is at one city block. It's not just a, like a little tiny museum. So I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if we could do it because you're one person, you're one person, but there was another museum. There was already a glass museum in St. Pete, but something that, that would complement us. And it was all created by a woman by the name of Beth Morian. And this woman said, oh, God, I want to give back to my city. But I really love the work of Dale Chihuly. So she went around and she donated money and they acquired a number of pieces through donation and created what we call the Chihuly Collection, which happens to be directly across the street on Central Avenue to the Imagine Museum. So again, this is the start of the Imagine Museum. It used to be a school. And again, we had a very little budget to transform it to what it is. I mean, literally just paint. And it's amazing what paint can do to a building, but it can definitely transform it into a wonderful place where people can have a wonderful relationship, get married, have kids, go to, you know, kids go to college, they get divorced. No, I don't know. No, it's just a beautiful place where you can entertain, where people can get together and it become like us, a habitat. So what happens is a little bit of paint, a little bit of love, and you have, voila, the Imagine Museum. Kind of incredible, right? Yeah, I think it's incredible. But that was just 450 pieces of American artists. So after that, a couple of years, she's buying things here and there. And what we realize is that you know, according to my father, who, who has been out of this whole situation for a long time, he said, you know, um, and he's written this in his book. If you any of you guys have his book, if not, let me know. Um, I'll send you a link to buy one. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> um, he told me one day, hey, glass didn't start in America in 1962. It started 10 years prior and 10 years after all over the world. So I brought that idea to Trish, which would have been the second pitch. And we started this another amazing glass collection, but a worldwide glass collection. So how were we gonna get there? Of course, it relied on me. How do you develop a worldwide glass collection? So let's go back, talk a little bit about what the collection is right now. So right now, of course, we use Harvey Littleton and Dominic Labino as the base, the core, the seeds. And then the branches come up to Dale Chihuly. And of course, what I love about this, by the way, Dale Chihuly and Billy Morris, which are both in the collection, the Dale Chihuly is from the Sassen collection in 1978, which was uh, Chihuly's very first exhibition at the Smithsonian, which is really kind of remarkable. It's his very first big show. It's the very first time he took uh, pieces and put pieces inside pieces, which was kind of remarkable. He signed each one of them. And at the time, you were able to buy an individual piece inside a different piece. So if you saw a piece on the big table, you could just buy that particular piece, which is quite remarkable. Anyhow, what I find remarkable is these are two different collections, two different places in the world, okay? The one on the left-hand side, which is Dale Chihuly, and the one on the right, which was his gaffer at the time, Billy Morris. And even though it doesn't look like it in the pictures, they're both made from the same type of candium red. And they both have the same black soot lip wrap, which is Pat and Chihuly. So they both helped each other making this work. It was done at the same type of glass at the same time, at the same period at Pilchuck but one became a Billy Morris and the other became a Dale Chihuly. I find that absolutely fascinating. And there's a lot of these lovely pieces, you know, um, at the at the Imagine Museum. Really, there's no information about it as of yet, 
but I'd love to dive deep into the, you know, talking about why we collected each one of these and what the significance is with the journey, um, you know, into the future of our class. So again, I, you know, I picked out some things that I thought were important. Of course, there's a Miro piece by, by um, Herb Babcock. This, uh, the middle piece was done by um, Henry Hallam but it was considered the very first social commentary created in glass based on the Kent State Massacre. And this is bronze, but the glass, blue glass piece goes with it. There's another one at Corning, there's one in Australia, and I believe there's a one last piece at another museum. But it was really important for me to get into that work into the museum. It took me seven hours on the phone going back and forth because it's a very difficult piece. And, you know, the museum's about beauty, it's about inspiration, but I really wanted significant work early on. And so we pushed and pushed and pushed. And I think I made $14 on the deal, but <laughs> I got it in. And uh, so I'm very happy and, and honored that that piece is in the Imagine Museum. On the right is Fritz Dreisbach's very first vehicle is in the collection of Henry Hallam. And in, he created this at Penland. And on the back of this truck has Dick Marcus's work, has um, a number of different artists, Lepofsky, other artists that were there at Penland at the time that put work in the trunk uh, bed of that truck, which is really fascinating. So, you know, of course there's outside influence that I had to mention. So even though the first part of the collection was national, I thought that, you know, the Lubinskys, I thought Lino, I thought a number of artists like Klaus Moye um, had an influence um, on what is made in glass. And here's a perfect lineage of influence because you've got, um, you know, Halava one that was made by Stanislav Lubinsky and Yaroslava Briktova in the 50s, late 50s. And uh, inspired by that particular piece was, was Howard Bentre. And he, to the point in 1979, he flew down to learn about how to cast glass from the Lubinskys. Um, he ended up taking, uh, you know, driving across country, meeting Dan Daly, meeting on Wolf. But the reality is the most influential artist was, was Lubinsky. And it, it's interesting because all three of these artists, with Lachazar Boyachev, who was influenced by Lubinsky as well, who worked with Lubinsky for a while at Brektova, um, realize that every one of them, the most important part is they make a drawing first and they never, ever, ever deviate from that drawing. So they create a drawing and from that drawing, they, they use that as the inspiration to create their work. And as they say, as soon as you deviate from that, it's over. So I, I find that absolutely fascinating that all three of those artists work the same way, which all is derived from one particular artist, which is the Lubinsky. Another uh, interesting um, artist, of course, Lino Tagliapietra, who came over, actually it was his brother, came over in 1978. He came over in 1979, invited by Dale Chihuly and Ben Moore to Pilchuk to teach artists how to actually blow glass. And what he actually ended up teaching these American artists is, is, you know, a lot of these Venetian techniques, you know, Marini and pulling cane and, and Colmo, which is bringing two hot pieces together. And of course, his biggest, you know, a, a, a huge influence for uh, uh, Stephen Powell was uh, Lino to the point where Lino came over to Daneville every year and visited him. So I was trying to get this connection, this influence, this impact that different artists had on, on the American glass movement. So of course the Imagine Museum, these are other artists, you know, that are outside of the, you know, the realm of not exactly connected so much, some of them by Pilchuk, other ones through Ceramic World, and then one of course through Rick Beck, but, you know, um, I'm just wanted to show a little bit of artists influenced other artists, which is kind of interesting, you know, again, um, you know, two artists that work together, one as a professor, and one as a student, and you can kind of see it in the work a little bit. I kind of took some liberties there, but you kind of do. And of course, the one on the left is in the uh, Imagine Museum collection. So how did this become an international collection? The pitch. I was so excited. I gave this wonderful, wonderful pitch to Trish, and we start flying all around the world collecting different pieces from different artists. It was one of the greatest times of my life. It lasted for about three years. And I, to give you an idea, I went to Prague about six times, you know, um, and, and spent a lot of time with different artists. Um, some of the most influential artists that are not even around anymore because they have passed away, unfortunately. 
but uh, it was it was a it was a, a really exciting time for us. So um, so here I am. I'm I'm telling Trish this is what the museum should be, and she's saying, "Well, I don't want that. I don't want negativity. I don't want the Henry Halem face. I don't want the Clifford Rainey about cancer, breast cancer. I want to uplift because that's what I'm about." So I kind of had to like take a back seat. And so as much as a curator, I was a museum guy, a gallery guy, an influencer, um, I kind of had to take a back seat. I would take her to the artist and I would give her my opinion, but she would do her own thing because that's who she is. She started to take a, an understanding of what art glass is. I mean, she's so brilliant. She would devour books in minutes. I one time gave her a, a, a trunk full of books. It's like 26 different books on different artists, you know, and she overnight had read every single one of them. And to the point where, I, you know, I, I approached her the next day. I said, yeah, so what did you think about that? She goes, you know, David Klein mentioned in his book about contemporary glass on page 72. I mean, like that brilliant. I said, oh my God, okay, well, she obviously read them and she's not falling asleep at that lecture anymore, but she got to a point where she, um, you know, is going to put her own feelings into things. And so she's excited about glass and she actually creates glass herself. And so now she's putting her own glass in the museum. And you know what? She loves to do that. She loves to work in glass. Marlena Rose showed her, but she's making Buddhas. Marlena made Buddhas, but you know, she loves this. So she's making more and more work and, and she's coming, you know, she started with one idea and she's got it into another idea. She's created over 6,000 works in a matter of four years. So like I said, we've traveled around the world. We've collected all these pieces. It's close to about 1,500 at this point. It's the largest Czech glass collection in the world. And, you know, I, when I say the largest Czech glass collection in the world, it's even larger than any museum in the Czech Republic or Slovakia. It is one of the most remarkable glass collections in the world. We'll get to that. One of her influences that she has is she loves the color blue. And I'm telling you, everything's blue. Her work is blue. Blue, 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 blue. Blue. Everything is blue. So I say I can't. You no, know, it's hard when when you know. For me, you know, I understand her love and her passion for the color. But what I don't understand is is that so many artists are working in so many different colors. The color doesn't influence that particular artist on what they're going to make. Which brings me back to Harvey Littleton, who said, "If you want to create something, create it in." So here we are. We're at the museum and everything has these blue colors. Is this my problem? No, it becomes Jane's problem, who is the director at the museum. Jane has to take the colors and, and, and put them in context. But both Jane and I realized, hey, it's not my museum and it's not Jane's museum, it's Trisha's museum. And this is what she wants. This is what she loves. So it, it was difficult, but you, again, we have to dive into who she is. So why is the color blue so important? Why is this color so important to her? So we asked her, so Trish, why is this color so important? She said, the world is blue. The water is blue. And I'm more influenced by the water than anything else in the world. I grew up in Virginia. Um, I was a Navy brat. I was on the water the whole time. My kids learned to surf. By the time that they were uh, six years old, they were on a surfboard. She said that, you know, she's, she's, um, she's gone down. She's the only women, woman to go down seven major rivers, the biggest rivers in the world, um, you know, in a matter of one year. It's kind of a remarkable story. She did it through National Geographic, but she did it. And um, <laughs> she loves water. I mean, that's her. She gets up in the morning and she submerges herself in water. She goes into her pool. She lives on the beach. She loves water. And so I, I didn't understand that. And then she loves blue. She says the planet is blue. We're the blue planet. So the imagine became blue, you know? And so, you know, she's, she's, everything is blue. And, and you know what? There are, yes, there are some other colors. There's turquoise. 
No, I'm kidding. There's other colors in there um, that she she loves, but it, it's amazing the influence that color has on people. So you do a color field study and, and you find out that blue is extremely calming. And, you know, for someone that needs that much blue in their life, something had to have happened. So you look at her life. What? I missed a slide. Hold on, Jane. So she's influenced by people she meets and people said, oh, my God, she's a Trump fan. I said, yeah, she's a, you know, but she also has met the Dalai Lama. She's written the autobiography, Oscar Elegisano from Costa Rica, the Nobel Peace Prize winner. So she is, she surrounds herself with these influential brainiacs and people that that she um, uh, loves and people that that help move the world, you know, whether it's. Trump when he's president or whether it's the next president, it's whoever that she feels that she that will have an impact on the world. Those are the people that she wants to meet because she wants to have an impact. And the Imagine Museum, the purpose of the Imagine Museum is not to collect the greatest works in, in the world. It's to have that, that, that influence, to have that interest and to expose the world to what she loves. And, and, and to educate people and let them know and to make these people, as she says, quote unquote, famous, even though a lot of them already are. So back to the museum. The museum has had five executive directors in five years. The longest running, Jane, who is on our um, show. But here's Nate. I got to give a, a, my hat off, my, my hard hat off to Nate because he was there in the beginning. Did he know what he was doing? Man, oh man, I think he had like the museum for dummies in the, in the back and he'd pull it and he'd open it. And, uh, but you know what? He struggled his way through it and he was such a nice guy. And then once Jane came on, she gave that educational component. She organized uh, the Imagine Museum and she really made it to what it is today. So I know she's on this call, but I want to give a shout out to you, Jane. Thank you, because without you, there would be no Imagine Museum. So Trish, what is she? She's a, she's a museum. She's a, she's an artist. She's a philanthropist. She creates work. She's made over 6,000 works in her lifetime. 6,000. And she keeps on creating and creating and creating. Does she do, do it to sell it? No, she doesn't care about selling her work. All, selling it would just give it validation to somebody. And she, one time I tried to sell a piece and, and somebody, what should I put? I don't know what the price is. Price it at 6,000. She goes, oh, I couldn't possibly give it away for $6,000. So I mean, like to her, she just wants to constantly create. And I mean, she's got a big heart. She adopted seven children and she raised them. And when I mentioned surfboards, you know, that's her last year in Costa Rica, surfing in front of her, her home. So we're traveling the world and she wants to get to know a lot of these artists. And she, we stumble upon one artist, Berto Valian. She said, Corey, I want to do a commission with Berto. I said, I, I can approach him, but the man's, you know, he's, 80 years old and he doesn't really need a commission. He really doesn't need much. He works for a major corporation, Costa Boda, and he's the main designer. And he gets a percentage of every single piece sold through Costa Boda other than their production glasses. He is a, you know, he doesn't need it. He's famous. In fact, his wife, Yorika, who had passed away, one out of every four households in Sweden has a piece by Yorika Valin. They're like legendary. There's 7 million people that live in Sweden. I mean, that's a tremendous amount of over a million people have work by these artists. So, you know, here I am, I have to approach Bertil. So I said, Bertil, I want you to uh, help me. I've got a project. I've got this uh, a woman and I want you to meet her. Okay. She's very, very interesting. So I bring her over and the first thing he says to me is I'm not doing a commission. I'm not doing a collaboration with this artist. There's no possible way. I don't need to collaborate. I have Costa Boda. I make boats for a living. I don't need to collaborate. I've been doing this for years. I'm on my way out. I've been doing it for so long. So what do you have to offer? 
So I just put them in a room together and they started talking and they realized two things. One, they both love water. They both love water. Bertil every morning gets up in freezing Costa or a forge, sub submerges himself in his little lake and comes out. And all of his work has to do with water. But they also have to do with loss. And so it's kind of an unsaid thing, but a all of Bertil's work has to do with loss. He lost a child. His child went out one day in a snowy, icy um, stream uh, in front of his house and never came back. And Trish lost a child to a very rare disease early on, her first child, actual child, her only actual child. So they had a connection, a connection that I couldn't sell either on, that I couldn't communicate to either because what do I know about water and what do I know about loss? So they decided to work together. How am I doing? Totally lost, but making great time. That's a Yogi Berra, by the way. This is a commission that I did of, by the way, um, with an Einstein quote about knowledge and museum. And that's Trish and I traveling the world, by the way, created by Steve Lynn. But here's Bertil. So Bertil had created this magnificent piece with the help of uh, Tom Hawk and uh, called Journey. And I was able to place this amazing, uh, magnificent piece dubbed the $1 million boat to the Flint Institute of Arts, which it's on permanent display. In fact, they built a room around this particular piece. And it's about passage of time. It's about communication. It's about a number of, of, of you know, things that, that you know, it, it, it's about the future. And so you can see how clear the tip of the boat is because your, your future is kind of uncertain, but your future and your present want to communicate to the past. So you're kind of in the middle right now. And that's why there's so much elements in the middle and so colorful. If it means something, it means something to him, you know? And so here we are, we're working on our commissions, you know, together. We're excited. And uh, look at the little beret, she put a little beret on because she's an autist and that's what they wear. They, uh, Bertel's in his classic sail, sailor man stripe, you know, and his red hat and we fly to Costa and we create some marvelous pieces. But Trish wants to put her love into it. And she also is inspired by journey, travel and space. So she, they create these rocket ships. So Bertel's like, what am I doing? I, I, I'm not gonna create a rocket ship. I'm not gonna create a spaceship. I've never done that before. But we, he went home, he looked up at this framed picture by the astronauts. And he, in 1992, had given a glass boat and it went up in space in NASA. And they were very excited about this. He was one of the first artists I know. There was another artist that we all know, Josh Simpson, who's married to an astronaut. Uh, uh, Bertel Vellin is the only other artist who had to have a glass piece up in, in space. And so he's got the documentation. There was a connection there with space, of course, travel, again, water and loss. And so really that's what these works are about. And they're really incredible, riddled with pieces. She went on to create over nine commissions, each one of them um, more spectacular than the next. And of course, she created some of the elements on the inside. You've got the alien faces, you've got the, the traveler, the rockets, you've got the, the, the celestial bodies, and of course, the Y, which is like a map in a way. And then the guardians, which we know as watchers, have, you know, and, and she did a wall piece about peace and freedom. And so she's onto this collaborative situation. After collecting all these pieces, she's inter interested in collaborating with artists that she absolutely loves. And one of them um, is Helvine. Gottfried Helvine is an artist out of Austria. He's one of the greatest <laughs> uh, figurative painters I've ever seen in my life. He's represented by major museums, major galleries all over the world. And he's in tremendous money museums. He's done the cover of Marilyn Manson's album. He's like a rock star. So I go and I visit his, of course, castle. Yeah, yeah, I said castle in, in Austria. 
So we go to his estate and he's got these rolling hills and he's got this castle that he built. And he says, you know, he's friends with Trish. We get together and, and in the morning they, they decided they want to create this body of work based on Mother Mary and these important people in, in, the, in our history. And so they created a painting and a glass and they did this wonderful collaboration. So again, totally inspired by water. Totally love this. That's her and her family now. You can see they've all kind of grown. Totally inspired by water, loves the rolling uh, rivers. Um, this is her uh, about two years ago during COVID when we're all like masks. She's outside, you know, uh, living her life on this river. You know, needless to say, they all fell out of that, by the way. Um, but uh, that brought us to another artist in Seattle, Martin Blank. So we traveled to Martin and, you know, we, they absolutely fell in love with each other. I don't even know. I didn't even do anything. They just started talking. And, and one of them mentioned a bowl. And they said, oh, yeah, we could do like a bowl together, a bowl that you would feed your children or one that a beggar would give and Santa Monica would hold up and ask for. Money. It was so beautiful and so seamless um, that they just they had this wonderful uh, connection that they had, not just on on the level of glass, but on the a more uh, spiritual level. You know, they both uh, they both have this like Buddhist mentality, which I which I absolutely love. And so, as we know, uh, this is a, 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 a installation called um, a river. Uh, if a river could tell a story and it consists of 52 objects of um, of. I want to say blown, but really blown and sculpted glass, some of them weighing close to 300, 250 pounds. So uh, it, it is absolutely remarkable. We see up in front, I think that's Gandhi, or it could be Moses. I'm not quite sure if it's Gandhi or Moses. You know, it, it's, it's, it's really difficult because Trish is a, um, you know, she's into uh, doing things extremely detailed, you know, to a point where they become, I don't want to say that represent, yeah, representational. And, and Martin is more of an abstract artist. Even his figures are abstract. So it's difficult to communicate the two um, points, but they did. And I think they did very well, very seamlessly. And of course, Martin's work is about the space in between or the connection between these different objects that they have with each other. But if you look at it very closely, you'll see that they're individual people, but it really is this roaring river. Um, really quite remarkable. Here's another image of it. Look at it falling down in the museum, just cascading down with those, those beautiful blues and greens. It's, I think, very spectacular. So there's another artist, Mart Yanetsky, that I got her kind of excited about. Mart Yanetsky, um, again, part of the lineage. It goes, you know what? Littleton, Chihuly, William Morris, Mart Yanetsky. Mart Yanetsky learned blowing glass to William Morris. He's a Czech artist. He's the only Czech artist that has a glass blowing facility on the foothills of the Prague Castle, castle and the only glass blowing facility in Eastern Europe, believe it or not. He started it during COVID. Next time you're in Prague, I'll take you through it. It's really quite incredible. But he is also considered one of the greatest glass handlers of our day. All of these faces have been done inside out. So he used tools to go and manipulate the surface of the glass by pinching and pulling and grabbing, but done all from the inside out, not sculpting on the outside like you know most artists do, such as Richard Jolly or even Martin Blank. So the way that he works is unlike any other artist. And if any other artist works like him, it's because he's taught on six different continents and they've taken one of his courses. So he is um, definitely an incredible artist. He's in his 40s, but uh, definitely check him out, Martin Yanetsky. Um, you know, follow what he's doing. But these are, he did 14 aliens for Trish at the Corning Museum. They're a blue glass, but they turn gray, which is kind of incredible in the light. So again, this is this is all three artists kind of blend together. You got the Martin Yanetsky, you got the Bertel Vellin, and then behind the Gottfried Helvine, which did this unbelievably detailed alien painting as a gift for her. And, uh, you know, they're absolutely remarkable. I mean, he at one time was commissioned by uh, Michael Jackson to do um, a spectac another spectacular um, a painting, which I wish I had an image of right now. So, you know, he she's going around and finding these these maestros to work on her work with her. And and she's not doing it because she wants, she likes the people. Like I mentioned, it's the connection to the people, which brings us to Lino Tagliapietro the greatest glass handler in the world. I didn't say that. You know who said it? Dale Chihuly. Dale Chihuly said that. 
He said, Lino Teclupietra is the greatest glass handler in the world. So here's an image of him to the left and to the right, there is what he has created with Trish called the Saturno, which he had created throughout his career. But if you pull a Saturno on its side and you, you know, through the elements that she's gathered, you have what you have is a Saturn spaceship, something. But she fell in love with it. He fell in love with making them. They developed a really nice uh, relationship and developed quite a nice collection. Uh, at the Imagine Museum. Ronnie Plessel came along, okay? Ronnie Plessel took over Lubinsky's, uh, uh, as professor of his program, and uh, he is a phenomenal artist. Uh, this is a collaboration that Trish and he, he did on the left corner that was exhibited at the Victoria Albert Museum in 2019. It's made with uranium glass with a, a different type of technology, a new technology um, on creating glass. There's two guys that figured out a way to create to cast three dimensional, totally three dimensional um, in the Czech Republic. And they have the rights to this information. Uh, Berenik is another artist that cast his work this way using that technology, but very few artists uh, use that technology, which is kind of uh, remarkable. So but if there's any artists on here and you want to get in contact with these guys, they, it could be life-changing for you. So anyhow, this was on display during design week. It was up for about 10 days. And then of course it had to be taken down, but um, what an uh, amazing feat. So I might be going a little bit over here. I apologize, but I'm going to zip through this as fast as I can, because there are I even took down about a hundred slides. I mean, this is such a vast uh, collection, but some of these great connections um, with Sigler, you know, he's, uh, we, we visit his home. Uh, we visit home, his home about six times. Trish has collected about, oh, exactly 53 pieces. Why do I know that? Because in the, <laughs> because the last two pieces were collected during COVID. Uh, but she's collected some monumental work. Some of them are, you know, uh, uh, are entire rooms of glass, um, uh, entire rooms that you walk in and out of because he's not just an artist, but he's an architect. So this is a couple uh, images of this piece. We also fell in love, of course, with the Lubinsky, Lubinsky Brichtova family, you know, and we met Yaroslav while we were there in Yaroslava. Um, and Trish fell in love with this shape, the pyramid shape. You know, it's it's uh, she she loves these the the pyramid and the idea of the unknown and actually here's an image of the green eye of the pyramid which is um, probably the most well known uh, uh, sculpture that they had created originally for Corning Incorporated. There's only one in a private collection that I am aware of, um, but all the rest are in museums, which is um, really kind of incredible. I. Uh, the story goes that Yaroslava was um, walking up uh, the pyramids during an exhibition, Crystal La Mancha in 1992. And uh, I heard this story from Lillian Zonars who used to work at the gallery and they were kind of together. And she said, you know, she was so inspired by these pyramids. She went home and she decided this is what she wanted to do. And uh, so they created this wonderful green eye, uh, the pyramid. Well, unfortunately there's no green eyes available. So I had to tell Trish, I'm sorry, you can't have it. And uh, so she didn't like that. You know, uh, she didn't like me telling her she can't have that. So she ended up having it created in blue. The last piece that has ever been created by Yaroslava in her lifetime resides now just on display for the very first time at the Imagine Museum of Glass. It's the blue eye of the pyramid created, inspired by Yaroslava's first trip in 1992 and created and finished in 2000. And it's, it's a, it's, I would call it the crown jewel of the Imagine Museum collection. So we've told the story, we're moving on, we're branching out, we're growing from this little seed after five years into this wonderful glass community in St. Pete, but as well as um, telling that successful story. Here's a couple other, oh, moved very quickly, but you know, I just wanted to say the largest collection of both Brent Key Young as well as uh, Paul Stankard 
one of the largest collections of Paul Stanker, not the largest collection, but one of the largest ones. Um, we got it from uh, a collector that absolutely uh, carried on the tradition. It wasn't Michael Belkin, but another collector that absolutely loved Paul Stankert and collected nothing. The, the piece on the bottom right was actually exhibited at the Chicago Institute of Arts, which is kind of a, a, a great honor. So moving forward very quickly again, Lino, Here's another piece that was created based on the Saturno piece on the left is also to imagine uh, the concerto, which if you've ever been to Lino's studio, uh, his gallery in Seattle, this was up in his gallery for over 15 years. He considered it his masterpiece, now resides at the Imagine Museum. Um, there isn't many Chihuly's, but this blue one is definitely there um, because Chihuly was one of the artists that influenced so many artists to be working with the material that we used him as a corridor and you'd walk through and you could see Thurman Statham was in his class at RISD, uh, Weinberg, Glancy, um, Hank Murda Adams. Uh, there was, you know, Dan Daly, um, Tutzinski. A lot of these artists came through the Chihuly program, Howard Bentray, and touched Chihuly along the way, and, and then took their information and passed it on. And so, you know, you have the museum growing, um, which is quite amazing. Again, we're looking at the kids, looking at this beautiful Tim Tate piece amongst the uh, Brazons, you know, Oban Abright you know, who uh, has a wonderful career working out of the Bay Area. This piece is entitled Michael. Um, Again, the largest Czech glass collection in the world consists of 50 works by Peter Hora. Here's 20 of them. So we want to congratulate Imagine Museum. They have such an extraordinary collection, but we also want to congratulate Trish because like I said, she doesn't collect art. That's the biggest, she doesn't collect art. I could show her art all day. She collects the people. 23 pieces by Karen Lamont, makes it the largest Karen Lamont collection in the world. Here's a beautiful piece, the largest XNAR collection in the world. He does remarkable work. This is us in Italy where we met Seguso and we convinced Livio who loves every piece like his child to give us a about half the collection that he has kept at the foundation and let us acquire it for Imagine. So it's the largest Livio Seguso collection outside of Murano. Really remarkable. In fact, when the museum is going to be done in the next few years, there will be a, a, an entire Italian wing dedicated to Livio Seguso as the entrance and then going on to a lot of Italian artists. We've got a, a major Albert Paley installu installation that's 20 feet tall by 20 feet high that has glass and metal, uh, the largest glass and metal uh, creation that he's ever created that will be um, uh, shipped over to us. A tremendous amount of his work is in the collection, over 62 pieces. Um, again, that's us looking at a particular piece that I ended up acquiring um, of Karen's. The Cloud, um, we have one of her clouds that I believe that one was on display um, in, at the Venice Biennale, during the Venice Biennale at Barango. Um, really a remarkable piece. Uh, we had a wonderful time in the Czech Republic where we collected a tremendous amount of, um, of John Kiley's work. We got to actually watch them explode. Do behind you is are the exploded pieces, which is kind of fun. I have it all on video. I wish I could play it, but I don't have time. Peter Bremer's, largest collection of Peter Bremer's ever collected. Uh, she loves Peter. They had a really wonderful connection, but who doesn't love Peter? Um, Vladimir Klumpar. I mean, she happened to have this piece in her studio. I mean, come on, we're talking about water here. You know, <laughs> we stumble upon this and she didn't even ask the price. It was just done, you know. Uh, remarkable collection of, of Vladimir who came in for the fifth anniversary. So I just, you know, I, I, I just want to let you know, you know, I'd love to do another lecture of every single piece of the collection, but it's very difficult to do. Um, so our last journey with, that we had, which was kind of remarkable, we went from uh, Tobias Mole's studio in Abeltoff, where she acquired this huge uh, panel of Tobias Moles to uh, On Wolf. 
And, um, you know, on, she used to call me and she's this very stern woman. Um, she, Cody, you know, she'd get on the phone like, oh, and she'd say, hey, you know, um, why haven't you sold my work? You know, I, I am a good artist. And I said, and it's really just, she's not stern, but she's extremely passionate like we all are. And, you know, she is a really good artist. In 1996, she went over and, and, and she was blowing glass um, throughout the 70s, Pilchuck, and she stopped showing her work in the United States because she heard that, uh, that people didn't like it. So she started just the show in Europe. And in, in, in 96, we went over there with a collector group and we realized that she was creating these glass pieces, cast glass pieces, doing a remarkable job, taking what she knew from the Lubinskys and making it her own. And so I think she's just an absolute phenomenal artist. But, but we went in and inquired the largest collection of her work outside the On Wolf Foundation. So, I, you know, again, I just want to reiterate, this is one of the most remarkable collections in the world. There's 16, oh, just about 1600 pieces, 800 of them check, and we're still continuing to collect. But it's gone beyond that. It's gone beyond that because, you know, Trish, you know, sees a need to tell the entire story. And there's a lot of holes in that story. There's the whole South Pacific that we haven't even ventured to. And so the, the world keeps going. The Imagine keeps going. Unfortunately, there are uh, five employees have left and now there's five new employees. And I, it's like I'm starting over again. I'm like, oh, my gosh. You know, I'm, 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 I'm trying to teach these the, the, the museum what to do and how to do it. And, and, and so it's going to be an ongoing process, I feel like, to the rest of my life. But, you know, eventually, eventually um, it, it's going to take new legs. And so uh, I'm excited for the next uh, five years. But this was the first five years. And I hope you enjoyed my presentation. So um, I'm going to unshare. How do I do that? I'm not going to unshare. I don't even know how to unshare. I'm sorry. I don't know how to unshare. Oh, you have any questions? There's some in the chats. Let, let's figure this out here. Uh, help me out here, uh, Regina. I need you to come over here and help me out, please. Oh, hi. <laughs> how do, can people talk? I yeah, can. Uh, yeah, please unmute. Yep, oh, yeah, yeah. Talk. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hey, you look familiar. You look like a younger version of me. <laughs> what a good looking guy. Look at that guy. Wow. Yeah, I get to like you more and more. <laughs> My birthday's coming up, right? <laughs> so um, I know, again, this, this, this lecture was like a two-hour lecture because I, I had a lot of other pieces that I did not include, okay? But I want to show you guys something. It's called Instagram. Who's on Instagram? Me. Get on Instagram. Okay. This is Instagram. Everyone look at Instagram. Follow Visit Corey. Very important. If you're not visiting, following Visit Corey, then you're not seeing what's happening in our class. And if you care what's happening in our class, you're not seeing it. I'm going to tell you why. Because Visit Corey. I have 158,000 followers, okay? And every day I have nine to 10 different new posts of what's happening now in our class. Not what's happening at Habitat, but what's happening now. So when you go to visit Corey, you know, there's a little bell up here. I want you to click on the little bell at the top. Where's the bell? I don't see the bell. Okay, so let's say I go visit Detroit, visit Corey. I want you to follow me and open up your notifications. Click on the bell and it's not on mine, but it's on yours. Click on the bell and then you can follow me. Okay, now let me give you an idea. I had 20 million people visit my ongoing thread of Art Glass. Okay, 20 million people in the last month, 4 million in the last seven days. Chihuly has 139. The God of Glass has 139,000. I have more people now following this thread about Art Glass and what's happening now in Art Glass than any other marketing, any other program, any other museum, including Corning. 
So if you want to see what's happening at all of them, all they do is pull all their threads into one, and that's mine. So what's happening at Corning, what's happening at the Museum of Glass, what's happening at Chrysler, what's happening at RISD, what's happening by Chihuly, what's happening at Lino, every single person I pull in, whatever they're creating, and I drag them into my feed, and I show the world what's happening. So please follow me, and if you haven't done it, and you want me to walk you through Instagram or how you can also increase your following, I'll show you how to do that. I'm happy to do or help and pass the knowledge. I'm on to YouTube next, but uh, right now it's 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 pretty incredible, and I get a lot of great uh, comments and interesting uh, um, uh, new, uh, hopefully new clients, but for the most part, new artists and uh, a lot of people that are just interested in what is that? What are they doing? What is what is that? Is it plastic? What are they? What is it? What's that thing? Is that a blowpipe? I don't know. So I'm I'm it's it's, it's uh, just about 100% educational until I can figure out how to put a store on it. But right now it's hundred percent educational. So please take a look, follow me and uh, you won't regret it. Or you might, cause I do post nine to 10 times a day. So, um, <laughs> but if you want to learn about glass, that's what you do. And I'd love to teach you. I could do an entire seminar on how to create your own Instagram. If you're interested in doing that, um, you know, please uh, let's see any other questions, anything else, Jane, you got something for me, what you got? No, great job, Corey. Uh, you know, it's it was uh, it's been quite a ride, and just looking forward to the next five years. Thank you, Jane. Jane, Jane. Yes. How yes. difficult was it? Just be honest. Come on, it's only recorded. Just be honest. <laughs> Honestly, it was a delightful challenge. I'm happy that we got through the first five years, and uh, I wish Trish all the best moving forward to really uh, realize her dream and her passion with the the. Uh, contemporary glass art I'm I'm it you did a great job that collection the collection was why I was there as aside from all of the habitat people and the kindness of uh, Trish so um the collection is what everyone will out uh, will really be delighted in seeing because what I know and what I've seen it's fantastic well, thank you, Jane. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. I just want to let everyone know, too, at, at SOFA, it was kind of a crazy thing. Um, after Trish was collecting blue, the next year, everybody everybody started making blue pieces. There was blue everywhere. I mean, you wanted to see blue? It was that SOFA after the Imagine Museum opened. It's true. It was absolutely remarkable. And one of the things that Jane did, because she has such a great eye, not just for glass, but for art, is she brought us to um, a piece by uh, Anthony James that wasn't blue, but became <laughs> this uh, extraordinary uh, part. So she brought in this piece over, um, brought us over, and, and um, now it's part of the collection. And now he has this enormous career. He was in, you know, uh, The Glass Onion, which was an exhibit, uh, a, a movie that mm -hmm. Daniel Craig and a lot of famous actors were in. And, you know, he uh, his career is absolutely blown up, but um, but we got in on the ground floor, thanks to Jane Buckman. So um, that's just one ma minor thing. She's done it. Oh, you're too kind. For our gallery <laughs> and for the museum. So that's- I totally know what you have done, Corey, for this collection and, for, and with Trish. So uh, it is a lifelong project, I hope for you and uh, for the museum. So uh, just waiting for all of those new trips and the new art that you guys will acquire together. And if you need a companion, you can always ask me to come along. Oh, you're a great <laughs> companion. We were in Italy recently together. That was fun. Yes, yeah, we got yes, totally yes. lost. Yes. It's great. You know what's great when you're fun. lost? There's always a cafe and a place to drink. I, mean, I don't know how that happened. I it's just like every corner. Oh, there's a cafe. We'll sit down. We'll have some more pasta. I don't know. Yeah, I'm a fun <laughs> companion. That was fun. I hear yes it was a lot of fun so why winding up if nobody has any more questions whatsoever i'm gonna just say thank you so much for your support in the glass world and thank you for your support at this uh for these zooms our next zoom guess what time 1 p.m saturday next saturday and this time it's gonna be aaron so he's gonna 
he's going to give a talk with his top hat and does a wonderful job. So I hope you're there. I'll be there. And uh, let's carry on. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, Corey. For your Great Love job. You